everyone, and welcome to Read This Now, the weekly webcast where Brad Gustafson and I share two books that we love and we think you should read when, Brad? Immediately. Right this second. Right now, I mean, right now. Yes. <laughs> Stop watching this video and read them. Although that's kind of weird because I don't know how you could read them. You don't know what they are yet. So I don't cool know. If What's somehow it? they could read or look at the book while we were talking about it, but then they would have to be able to look in the future and know what we we're going to talk about and have it ready. That Somebody, work. this just goes back to my never ending desire for someone to invent a time machine so that I can get everything I need to get done in a day. This just mm. goes back to that, right? Sounds fantastic. Or how about a time stretcher? Like just an extra yes. hour each day. That's all, yes. all I really need. I might need a little more than that, but I won't complain with an extra hour. I would, yeah. I would be grateful Good start. for that. We can, once we it. have the hour, then we can adjust the dial and go for two. I love it. I love it. Let's make this happen, Gustafson. Yeah, I let's feel do like it. Let's is, do it. Okay, I so it. I fell in love with the, this book I'm hugging right now, in case you can't tell, mm -hmm. because the artwork, uh, it just pulled me in. It's just stunning. Mm. And the cool thing is it's about hurricanes and, and a significant weather event. So for me, living in Minnesota, if if there was a book about tornadoes, I would I would connect with it on a different level. But hurricanes, sure. I just know about mainly from a distance, uh, right? So this book, um, I'm just throwing that out there because I think depending on where you're reading this book from in the world, you'll you'll connect differently. As it turns out, the main character in this story is living in a, a place that has a hurricane. So I'm going to share now. I'm going to give away mm -hmm. the cover. John Rocco, it's Hurricane uh, Keldicott Honoree, who I came to realize also wrote Blackout and Blizzard mm -hmm. um, as well. So I just want to share, I have three pages flayed to give you a flavor for this book. And I hope you can see how stunningly glorious mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. um, it feels like a work of art and I'm sensing the camera might not be picking this up, but this boy has a relationship with this doc or this peer. So here's one of the pages in the near the beginning of the story. And I just love kind of almost the time mm. lapse. It, it's like yeah. a sooth soothsayer with the time machine commentary, Jen, because yes. I love how this captures, uh, you can just picture him interacting on different days and throughout mm -hmm. the year doing different things on this pier or on this dock. And then uh, I'm skipping ahead and skipping parts of the story, but I just want to kind of give you a flow. The hurricane is happening now. He's at home kind of dreaming, worrying, thinking, and he's picturing this doc or peer that he has this connection with. And one of the things he's dreaming about is just kind of wondering like if all mm. what's happening and if all the extra sea life and animal life are cruising in. And then several pages later, um, that's not what happened. So when he goes outside to go fishing, this is what he finds in his front yard, like basically mm. devastation. Yeah. And then later on, it gets to the pier. And I'm not, I don't want to give it away. I want you, I want readers to be able to see kind of how that looks. And the story unfolds like there, it's about a hurricane, but it's also about a boy interacting with a place he loves, his mm -hmm. community trying to help them clean up and uh, recover after the hurricane and then hoping and wishing that people would help him do the same. Although his, his random doc isn't really high on their priority list. They're trying to like take care of stuff right away in their own front yards and backyards. And then at the end, a couple of text, text features I also thought were really cool. Well, there's a diagram of a hurricane and how it starts in the beginning of the book. And then at the end, there's, functioning parts of a pier, which I just Neat. geek out and love stuff like this. Yes. Like, I want to learn more about, I get what the rising tide, I get why that would need to float, but then I'm wondering how do people get to that part of the, the pier, the dock? Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you okay. mean like from the top or from, from the... the... So here's where he goes fishing, but yeah. here's where, like, I'm assuming this would be the beach or the parking lot but how do you get to this place? Wouldn't that be the open sea? So that's where the boats would dock? No, I think that's on this side. Unless I oh. read it wrong. No, I, I don't know, Jen. I don't know. Me neither, but okay. that's cool. I'm, uh, yeah, I am gonna do, I'm gonna um, just reveal the stunning work under the mm, dust jacket. Like yeah. 
John are teaching me to do. So I so that, love it. That is her again. It's a powerful book. It's captivating on, on many levels. And I do think you should read it immediately or right now, as, yes. as we like to say. As soon as possible. But that wasn't a, a, a good hashtag. So we had to go with read this now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you do know, you got? Any, any time machine connections to your story? No, or? but I do just want to say I lived in like sort of Hurricane Alley on the coast of North Carolina for nearly 30 years. I've weathered several storms myself and then ran away from many others, you know? Um, and so I know what a hurricane is like in the same way that you understand tornadoes or maybe tornadic activity in your community. And I love, I haven't read that book, but just in terms of recalling my own experiences, the idea of the peer or being, a, or a dock that gets destroyed or damaged or is potentially destroyed by a storm like that, I've witnessed firsthand how that really does devastate a community because those are gathering places. They are sort of the last stop before the open sea. People have lots of memories around those places. And so when they get destroyed or damaged in ways that feel irreparable, communities really rally around that. So that really speaks to me in a, in a very true realistic way. I'm anxious to see that book. It looks amazing. Thanks for sharing that. And that, for reasons you just said, that's why I, I now want to read the Blizzard book yes. that John Rocco wrote, because I, um, living in Minnesota, can really relate to blizzards on a yeah. pretty deep, regular sure. basis. So I kind of want to be, this is a weird, but I want to be the reader on that side of things. Yeah, you know? yeah, so. for sure. Because I think that, you know, for kids and just humans in general, ha books can sometimes help you understand things that you've never experienced, but then they can also help you, um, they can help acknowledge or understand how you've experienced things in a different way. So it's like, there's a lot of layers there. And I love that books are just so powerful, aren't they? Yes. It's almost like a friend. Like when you, with what you just yeah. said, you're reading and you're maybe connecting and relating to the author or their perspective or their feeling on yeah. something because you can relate to it. It's, it's a weird yeah. kind of connection with someone who's not there. Well, you know, that does like sort of, that is, there is a connection there then between the book that I read uh, or want to share this week, um, because I wasn't expecting to connect with this book in the way that I did. And it really like made me think about, it, it recalled for me some memories from when I was a kid, right? So, you know, my, I grew up pretty poor and transient. My family moved around a lot. And books were not always things that we could have in my house. But when I did have a book that was my own, I treasured it, you know, like it was a really a special thing to be able to have a book. And I remember, trust me, this is going to lead to today's book, but I have to tell this story to begin with. Um, as a kid, and this is going to make me sound like super nerdy, but that's okay. I'm, I'm fine. I own that for sure. I, I remember having, and I don't remember the author, but I remember having this book that was called um, Paul Bunyan and the Big Blue Ox Babe, or the Babe, the Big Blue Ox, about the legend of Paul Bunyan, you know, the giant like lumberjack who could like fell entire forests with his giant axe, and he had a big blue ox named Babe, right? And, yep. and I hope you're teach. I hope you're teaching this to our three and a half viewers because I'm pretty sure Paul Bunyan is from Minnesota, so I'm, I'm with. You. Oh, okay. Well, it may be. I don't know, but that actually goes along with how this story is going to play out because. Um, for me growing up in the Northwest, which is a heavily forested area, I very much associated Paul Bunyan, my dogs are going crazy in the background, sorry, Paul Bunyan with the area that I live with and lived in, you know, like, so I would never have known that Paul Bunyan was maybe Minnesotan. Like maybe I I'm just- unfairly claiming Paul, maybe- I don't know what to fight over Paul Bunyan, who knows, <laughs> okay, right? But, but that's okay. Like I didn't, I read that little blue book, which was like an early reader book, like not a picture book, not a chapter book, an early reader book. I'm going to have to look it up because I can remember the cover, like as if it were sitting right here. And I must have read that book 112 times. Like I read it over and over and over again. I absolutely loved it. 
I never really, it never occurred to me like why a legend like Paul Bunyan would exist, like how these myths are created about like how the conditions of loggers during that time would have been so dangerous and, um, you know, uh, difficult that they might need to create these myths about their work in order to give them like courage and camaraderie to keep going, you know, like I would never have thought about that, right? But then I picked up this book to, to read because it was shortlisted for the National Book Award. It's called The Legend of Auntie Poe and it's by Xing Yin Kor and it's a graphic novel, okay? And it's a graphic novel that I would say is good for like fifth or sixth grade or above. Although I would use this with my high school kids too because there's lots of layered meaning here. It's about a young girl whose name is May she lives and works in a logging camp ever in the uh, 19th century with her father, who is the camp cook. May was born in the United States, but her father is a Chinese immigrant and her mom has long since passed away, okay? May feels like her story is sort of already written. Like she has no choices or option as a Chinese girl living at this time in history, she knows she's never going to get to go to school. She's never going to get to choose what her life is. Her life is written out. She, if she's lucky, she might be, get to be the head cook at a logging camp like her father, if she's lucky. Otherwise, she'll just have to be the assistant cook as she is now for the rest of her life. Her best friend, B is the daughter of the camp foreman and who's also white. And in lots of ways, B feels like her life is written out for her too. She doesn't understand that just by the fact that she's white and that her dad has this like more important position, she has options that May doesn't, right? So even though they're best friends, there's sort of this tension between them. But then the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed. And that's not like literally expressed in the book, but you kind of know it. And you, they talk about it in the author's note, right? Mm -hmm. And at that, then at that point, May and her family and all the other Chinese logging workers, and there were lots and lots and lots of Chinese people who worked as loggers during that time, their life becomes very difficult as violence against them increases, where um, logging companies who hire Chinese people are threatened with boycotts because of racial tensions between uh, white America and Chinese America, et cetera. And so suddenly May and her family and these loggers, they're in real danger. And so May starts to see these visions of Auntie Poe, who is this giant matriarch logger and her giant blue ox named, I think you would say Pei Pei. I'm not really sure if I'm saying that name correctly. I haven't researched it enough. I need to do that. Um, but May begins to see these visions of this giant logger who comes in and like saves her community and can like, uh, you know, uh, bust out log jams, et cetera, et cetera. And she begins to tell these stories to the other kids in the camp until she kind of believes that they're true and some of the kids start to as well. And it's not really until their, their camp community is becomes in some real physical danger when there's a log jam on the river that uh, May has to decide whether or not she's going to put her faith in Auntie Poe or if she's going to be in charge of her own story. So in this book, I get to like relive my Paul Bunyan childhood. I get to also understand that these legends are not unique to one geographic area, to one group of people, et cetera, they're created out of a need. And then when that need isn't there anymore, they sort of get passed on to the next people who need them, right? And I learned all sorts of cool stuff about logging. Like I just feel like this book ticked off so many boxes for me. But I also think it's just a fun story that kids will relate to. Even younger kids who aren't maybe gonna get into all those layers, I think would be really interested in the artwork and the adventure side of the story, et cetera. So it's again, shortlisted for the National Book Award. I love the National Book Award because they always include books I've never heard of. And so this is a on the short list. I'm excited for people to read it. It's called The Edge Legend of Auntie Poe. And I think you should read it right now. That is amazing, Jen. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And 
I'm pe- I'm feeling guilty about trying to claim Paul Bunyan now because it's <laughs> very clear that lots of people know of Paul and other. <laughs> Yes, but that's the thing. I mean, that's the thing, though, Brad, about these legends is people do claim them, like, because they yeah. serve a purpose, like, in our mythology. But I think one of the other things I didn't really mention, but that I absolutely should, is that sometimes those mythologies leave out, like, you know, the legend of Paul Bunyan and log that logging history doesn't include all of the Chinese workers who Mm. were exploited and who were given much less pay and segregated, et cetera. Mm. Doesn't include all the indigenous people who were forced off of their land so that we could log, you know, so that they could be logged, et cetera. So there's a lot of erasure there. um, And it's wonderful for books like this to both celebrate the myth and the real sort of human emotions that those myths help us deal with while also acknowledging the stories that have been left out of those myths. So I love it. I thought it was great. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And if you're looking for more graphic novels and other amazing books from almost every genre, I think we're getting, we gotta be getting close on that one. We are, we're there. (laughs) Go to bit.ly forward slash read underscore this underscore now. And there is a plethora of titles and even video archives for when you're uh, Netflix binging, you run out of whatever show you're currently watching, you can just check out Jen and I talking about books. That's right. Yesterday when Facebook exploded and there were no social media, you could still go to our archive. We're there for you. Even That's when the right. big we were here, in. people, we were here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. Happy reading everyone. We'll see you next week.